2017 was an exciting year at the Centre for Fortune Zoology, the world's largest, and we like to think the best, cryptozoological research organisation. And we think that 2018 is going to be even more exciting. So let's take a peek behind the scenes and see what the core team of On The Track, John Downs and Charlotte Phillipson, are doing to prepare for the excitement of the year ahead. Wake up! It's time to do the introduction. <laughs> oh, hi viewers. My name's John Downs, and welcome to another episode of On The Track. <laughs> Because of climate change, all sorts of unlikely animals are turning up on Britain's shorelines. This is something I haven't seen for nearly 50 years, not since I was a child in Hong Kong in the late 1960s. It's a Portuguese man of war, probably the most iconic jellyfish in the world, and certainly one of the most feared. Despite rumours to the contrary, they're not actually fatal, which is probably a good thing, because it is estimated that there are at least 100,000 attacks on humans each year off the coast of Australia alone. Stings usually cause severe pain to humans, leaving whip-like red welts on the skin that usually last for two or three days after the initial sting, although the pain should subside after a few hours, depending on the biology of the person stung. However, the venom can travel to the lymph nodes and may cause symptoms that mimic an allergic reaction, including swelling of the larynx, airway blockage, cardiac distress and an inability to breathe. Despite what I said earlier, they're not actually jellyfish. They are creatures called siphonophores, which, unlike jellyfish, are not single multicellular organisms but a colonial organism made up of specialised individual animals of the same species called zooids or polyps. A large number of these individual polyps are attached to one another and physiologically integrated to the extent that they are unable to survive independently and therefore have to work together and function like an individual animal. These creatures and their close relatives are not particularly rare and are found in the tropical oceans across the world. But for them to turn up on the south coast of Cornwall is a rarity and something which is likely to happen more and more often as the global climate changes. The name comes from the gas-filled sail which floats on the surface of the ocean and which fancifully looks like the sails of a Portuguese warship in the 17th and 18th centuries. But it is the tentacles which hold the stinging cells, which are both the most interesting and the most dangerous part of the creature. And, bizarrely, they can actually reach a length of 165 feet. There were sightings of these peculiar creatures all across the south coast of England and parts of Ireland during the summer. But as the autumn storms gathered strength, hundreds of them were washed up on the beaches of southern Cornwall. But they're not the only jellyfish or jellyfish-like creature in which I'm particularly interested. This is another animal which I first read about over 50 years ago in a book called The Hong Kong Countryside by G. A. K. Herklotz. This was one of my favourite books as a child and still has pride of place in my bookshelves today. In it, Herklotz wrote about 
freshwater jellyfish, and most particularly about a species which has been recorded all over the world, but about which even now very little is known. And although I first read about them in the later half of the 1960s, I still have never seen one alive. The story begins on June 9, 1880, when considerable interest was aroused in scientific circles in London by the discovery by William Sowerby, Secretary of the Royal Botanic Society and Director of the Royal Botanic Gardens in Regent's Park, of large numbers of the little freshwater jellyfish or medusa in the tank containing Victoria regia water lilies from South America and other aquatic plants located in one of the garden's hothouses. Never before had any such creature been found in the British Isles and it was at once realised that the little jellyfishes could not be indigenous here. Because they were found in the Victoria Regia water lily tank, it was assumed that their probable origin was South America, the home of this wonderful aquatic plant, to the stems of which spores, or possibly cysts, containing spores of the jellyfish might have adhered when the specimens of the plant were first brought to England, where they had remained dormant until favourable conditions caused them to develop into a mature medusae. In the third week of September 1939, Herklotz described specimens found in a tub in the biology department of Hong Kong University. In the tub in which the Medusa were found in Hong Kong were two water lily plants received direct from East Africa, which had been in the tub for at least 15 months, and also some water hyacinth plants from a local source. Herklotz noted, therefore, that the Medusa in the tub may therefore have been of either African or Hong Kong origin. It is now thought that the species is originally native to the Yangtze Basin in China, but that it is an invasive species that has been introduced widely around the world, the only continent where it has not been found being Antarctica. It is usually found in calm, freshwater reservoirs, lakes, gravel pits or quarries, and has even been found in Yorkshire, so I may eventually be able to seize some alive and tick yet another item off my zoological bucket list. The CSZ is in touch with researchers all over the world. Recently, Richard interviewed a Spanish researcher in the wilds of Central Asia, but we better ask Richard to introduce him. Gustavo Sanchez is a biologist, a Spanish biologist, um, originally from the Canary Islands. Now, he is in Kazakhstan uh, studying uh, snow leopards and other wildlife composed sheep and the best ways to conserve them. Now over there, uh, whilst he was there, he's heard many stories about the um, wild man, the Kazakh wild man, who sounds identical to the Russian Almasti. And he's been collecting these stories, interviewing witnesses, and um, as a sideline to his main work, he has been compiling um, evidence the existence of this creature. So, um, what, what is the local name for the wild man? Right, right. This is uh, most of the Kyrgyz people uh, refer uh, to the to the wild man as a as a she um, geek, K S Y G I I K, she geek, which means yeah, literally wild man or or or, or wild creature, you know. Then you have also uh, other other names like Karadam, which is meaning literally a snowman, and uh, in, in this that's in that's in Kyrgyzstan, and in Tajikistan, which is a neighboring country to the south, uh, dominated by the Pamir. The, the Kyrgyzstan is basically dominated by the Tian Shan mountain range, and in the Pamirs in Tajikistan, uh, where I was two weeks. Uh, approximately a month and a half. I was there two weeks with some local uh, uh, local anthropologists and other researchers, uh, also um, interviewing people and trying to gather some more information about this wild man in Tajikistan. In Tajikistan, is uh, it's called uh, the Golub Javan, Golub Javan. You know that's that's how it sounds. It's the local name and it means also again something like wild man or uh, mountain creature, mountain mountain man. Mm -hmm. 
in the local language. And what's, what, what sort of a description are you getting from the eyewitnesses? Well, you know, the classics, you know, uh, uh, fairly muscular and, and hairy, uh, biped uh, creature or hominoid, and uh, approximately between 170 to 2 meters, uh, over 2 meters in, in height, and uh, as I say, uh, uh, a heavy built uh, biped organism with, with a, a massive head and somehow like a cross between a human and, and a wild animal, you know, something like uh, a hybrid uh, creature that, that, of course, uh, immediately to our minds would come uh, the classic uh, portrait of a Neanderthal man or of a, of a, of a, of a Meganthropus, you know, something in, 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 that, uh, in that type of description. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I've gathered, personally, I've gathered two uh, eyewitness accounts and they talk about reddish, reddish hair color and uh, dark, dark uh, brown color, darkish brown with, with some tints of, of reddish, you know. So basically dark, uh, dark hair, uh, but in that, in that scale of, uh, of brownish reddish. some of the eyewitness accounts that you've heard? Well, the, the most striking or for me most spectacular, it's uh, uh, an interview uh, we made or I made, a, this was in March, uh, some months ago now, uh, in, in the region of, in the province of Nadin, okay, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, precisely in the town of Kasarman. There we interviewed an elder hunter. He was 77 years old, and he told us how approximately uh, 10 years ago he had a very close encounter uh, with a, a type of creature that we are describing here now. And in the mountains of Kasarman, he spied uh, this uh, tall hominoid uh, around 180 in height, uh, 180 meters in height, and. Uh, he looked at it for like over a minute and uh, he was totally puzzled at, at, at this creature because it it was not a bear, of course. You, you got to know, Rich, that the people here in, in Kyrgyzstan, especially the hunters, they know very much about big mammals, you know, uh, about, about the bears, about the wolves, about the wild sheep, about the Marco Polo sheep, about the ibex. They don't have a knowledge about little mammals, insects, birds. Um, reptiles, they got no idea. They that they don't even have local names for that. Uh, but their knowledge about big mammals it's huge, and uh, well, you know, their survival depends on that because they have to hunt for for meat a lot of times, and they are also shooting wolves for some bounty. The government gives money people here for for uh, wolves which are shot, and the bears are also animals which are very very uh, charismatic here and iconic almost uh, in some weddings it's it's uh, common to present some bear parts to the uh, couple that's getting married so in this case this this man told us that he could not recognize what this animal was and for him was like a like a very hairy and tall hominoid human that uh, even shouted at some point make some huge vocalizations and he was really scared and he uh, shot to the air one one shot with his shotgun and then this creature looked uh, back and disappeared in the mountains you know then he went to the place where this creature was and the, he found footprints and the footprints were around 35 centimeters in length and 20 in width the remainder of Richard's conversation with Gustavo will be available elsewhere very soon. But in the meantime, let's go over to Ohio, where our friend Colin Schneider is a little incensed about some of the comments that have been made about the recent discovery of a third species of orangutan. Hello everyone, Colin Schneider here for On The Track. Sorry for being out last month. Um, I had a lot going on and I didn't quite have time to record a video, but... This month, I'm going to be talking about something that kind of exploded in the news of cryptozoology and zoology in general um, a couple months ago. Now, this is a little outdated, but you probably heard that there was a new species of orangutan that was discovered, specifically the um, 
Tapanuli orangutan, a uh, scientific name, uh, Pongo tapanulia, tapanuliensis. Um, and if you're paying attention to cryptozoological news, um, basically every Bigfoot site out there, and pretty much every cryptozoologist out there, posted on their blogs and their social media, new species of ape discovered. This is just leading to the discovery of Bigfoot. If we hadn't, if we, um, if these guys, these orangutans could be, um, unknown for so long, uh, then Bigfoot has such a good chance of being out there, and it's, it's just inevitable at this point. And I noticed a couple things about reading, after reading these articles talking about the new orangutan, that kind of affected that. So, firstly... This population of orangutans, uh, the Tapanuli population, there's only about 800 of them. Yes, they're a new species, but there's not a lot of them. And they aren't new to our knowledge yet. Uh, they aren't new at all, really. What's new is their designation in basically where they fit in the taxonomy. For a long time, actually since uh, 97, we've known about these animals, uh, this population of 800 orangutans in uh, Tapanuli, um, Indonesia, and um, we, we, well, we've known about them, and for the past 20 years, scientists have been uh, debating back and forth, trying to figure out where to put them in the... Uh, placing the, the, the taxonomy, and it was recently decided that they're a new species due to their uh, smaller skull and uh, larger canines than the other two species of orangutan. Now what that means is they're not a new discovery of a species, it's a new kind of identification. We've known about them for about 20 years now, but it was finally decided that this is where they fit into the world. Um, and the thing is, this happens a lot in cryptozoology, a lot more than you would think. Um, every new species that is discovered, the large ones, the, the exciting ones, uh, people jump on the bandwagon and go, uh, well, this exists, so Bigfoot must be out there, or the Loch Ness Monster must be out there, and that's a poor argument. Um, <laughs> I hope I'm not going to be taken the wrong way. I do think there is a good possibility of certain cryptids to exist. I am incredibly skeptical of the Loch Ness Monster, and I think Bigfoot has a lower chance than some. But things like the Aren Pendek and the survival of the Thylacine, I'm fairly confident there's a good chance. But just because there's a new species of ape that was identified doesn't mean that there's a better chance that Bigfoot existed than a couple days before the announcement was made. Um, they're completely different cases, completely different habitats, completely different parts of the world. Um, it's really, really difficult to make a connection because there isn't really any. Um, so anyone listening, uh, anyone watching, I hope that um, this kind of this little tidbit of information, this uh, better understanding of the orangutan, the, the new identification, I hope this gives you a better appreciation of kind of how zoology goes and um, how it works and how cryptozoology can continue to work with zoology. Because I think, unfortunately, a lot of cryptozoologists are just really excited about the premise that Bigfoot exists, so they kind of take new discoveries and modify them to fit what they think um so if you're watching uh don't do that uh it kind of makes it hard for mainstream zoologists and scientists to listen and take us seriously um and i know that's something that the field struggles with all the time so definitely um sit down and actually read and understand what the new discoveries mean for zoology before you grab it and say this means Bigfoot must be out there. So I will see you all next month. I think I'm going to talk about the Eastern Cougar. So that's going to be fun. Bye.
John is probably most well known for his book about the Cornish Owl Man. But of all the flying humanoids, the American Mothman is probably the most well known. Lauren Corman has a new book about the subject, and when we phoned him, he told us all about it. As a lot of people know, the Mothman Prophecies came out in 1975. John Keel, very good book. And then in 2002, a movie was made. Uh, the Sony Screen Gems came to me. Lauren Coleman said, Do you, we hear you're writing a book on Mothman. Do you think you could finish it because we're coming out with a movie and John Keel is ill? Uh, John Keel had had a bunch of uh, operations on his eyes, and he was technically blind for over a year. So they needed me to help with the publicity. I did that. I wrote a book called Mothman and Other Curious Encounters, and I did over 400 radio interviews and magazine interviews and TV interviews. And then I sort of set that book and that moment in 2002 aside, but I very quickly noticed there was, was what I called the Mothman death curse. People started dropping like flies associated with the movie. And so in 2006, believe it or not, in 2006, I started writing my second Mothman book, and I just finished it after lots of stops and starts because Mothman is a very hard and evil subject to write about. And so I actually titled this book that just came out on December 6th, Mothman Evil Incarnate, because it's all about the, not the creature so much, but the psychology, the sociology, the evil that really underlines working with this creature, uh, working with the stories, working with the people. So my Mothman death list, which I've been compiling over the years, is now up to 100 people. So that's in there. Yes, that's in there. Uh, information has happened in the movie that's kind of strange. Uh, some different information about John Keel that most of the people don't know about. Uh, and also I put in there uh, a brief overview of what's going on in Chicago right now. There's Mothman reports uh, for the year of 2017 being reported in Chicago. Uh, and it's, it's all kinds of different possibilities with Chicago, but what seems to be underlying all of the sightings is that people have a a feeling of terror and foreboding. So I wanted to make sure I included that. During what is euphemistically known as the festive season, my little extended family were mildly obsessed with something that is generally considered these days to be the worst movie ever made. Charlotte. And now it is time for our monthly visit to the Watcher of the Skies. I've always felt a curious affinity with this species of bird, probably because for 30 years I was a secretary, and this is a secretary bird. A highly specialised ground-dwelling bird of prey from an older family than the other old world raptors. It is native to sub-Saharan Africa and is sadly non-migratory, so will never be a natural visitor to these shores. But I think you'd be surprised quite how many completely unexpected avian visitors Britain does have. And that's what this segment on the track is all about. Bernard Hoivermans himself said that cryptozoology wasn't the study of monsters, but the study of unexpected animals. And in the UK, what could be more unexpected than vultures, spoonbills and albatrosses? Yes, even the kings of the Southern Ocean have been seen in British waters. Two species of albatross have been recorded in the UK in recent years. Not all of our feathered visitors are quite so spectacular, but nearly every day there is something exciting to greet the Watcher of the Skies. Hello everybody and hello from Prudence and hello from Archie if you can see Archie, but you might not be able to see Archie, but he is there. Oh hello. Yes, very nice. Right, the oldest living member of the Gloucestershire Swan Dynasty returned from the Russian Arctic to winter in S at Slimbridge Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust in December. Croupier is the 26-year-old leader of one of the biggest Buick Swan families ever studied at WWT's famous Swan Lake at Slimbridge. Unfortunately, however, Croupier arrived without his longtime partner dealer, and although researchers hope 
that she has nearly become separated from him on the long migration, as Buick Swan numbers have been plummeting in recent years, they are not hopeful for her return. WWT's Swan research assistant Steve Heaven said, Families tend to be dominant groups on our Swan Lake and Krupa is from one of the oldest dynasties which have ruled Slimbridge since the 60s. We can trace the legacy of these powerful Swan families as we've been studying them closely for decades and drawing up family trees using their distinctive build patterns to identify each, each member. Krupia has also been referred to as the Cobb Father, which is really rather cool. And maybe that is a cue for some music. Maybe not. We shall see. During November, cold tits were seen in over 70% of gardens, according to figures from the British Trust for Ornithology's BTO Garden Birdwatch and it is thought that the cold weather or a lack of tree seeds in the wider countryside may be behind the rise in sightings. Participants in the BTO's Garden Birdwatch survey have been keeping weekly records of the birds seen in their gardens over the last 20 years. An incredible citizen science project that enables the BTO understand how birds use human, habit human habitats such as gardens. Cold tits are among our smallest garden birds and are often driven away from bird feeders by the larger, more aggressive great tits and blue tits. They have a habit of darting to a feeder, quickly taking a seed and hiding it in moss or crevice to eat later. Cold tits can be recognised by their striking black and white striped heads and by their overall brown and grey plumage, with none of the yellow or blue seen in the great tits and the blue tits. The now news of cross, from across the pond informed us that there were several out of place birds that really should not have been where they were spotted. A summer tanager was observed for the first time in Metro Vancouver. This bird has only been recorded six times in British Columbia and never before in Metro Vancouver, according to the BC Rare Bird Alert website. <coughs> According to the National Audubon Society, the normal wintering range of the summer tanaga is central Mexico to Bolivia and Brazil. In summer, it mainly breeds in northern Mexico and the southern and eastern United States. Adult male summer tanagas are brilliant red, while females and immature males are bright yellow green. A Michel, Michel, a Michel, sounds like Sean Connery, a Michel, a Michel thrush. A missile thrush, a mega rarity bird, arrived in Miramichi, New Brunswick, Canada during December last year, landing in the garden of a resident. Jim Wilson, a bird and naturalist from New Brunswick, said it doesn't get any rarer than this. This is the very first time a missile thrush has ever been seen and recorded in North America. The bird is widespread in Europe and has also been found in Iceland. This one was likely brought to the east coast by heavy winds and separated from its flock. Wilson also said it's really quite amazing how far these migratory birds can fly in a single flight. And our last item for this episode is undoubtedly going to cause a few titters from over in the um, cheap seats. Far from its home on the Galapagos Islands, a Nazca booby was spotted first in <laughs> New For heaven's sake, Karina, how old is he? Five? As I said, a Nazca booby was spotted firstly <laughs> in Newport Beach, California, then by a deckhand on a fishing boat, and again on the rock jetty where boaters. Boaters and boaters. Boats enter and exit the Dana Point Harbour, according to Donna Calais, manager of Dana Wharf Whale Watching. The Nazca booby breeds primarily on the Galapagos and Malpelo archipelagos, but on occasion can be found offshore from mainland South America with small breeding populations along the Ecuadorian and Peruvian coasts, as well in the Pacific coast of Central America. And that is it for this episode. We are now going over to Jonathan 
for his look at this episode's new and rediscovered species. And that's all from Prudence. That's all from the squeaking dog Archie over there because he got upset because he was being ignored. And it's goodbye from me. Uh, goodbye. This is a new frog species found in high elevation forests of New Britain Island and the Bismarck Archipelago of eastern Melanesia. The new species, Cornifer exudrus, is a biogeographically distinct member of the Batrachiliodes clade, representing the first record of this subgenus from outside of the Solomon Archipelago. The Bismarck Archipelago, by the way, has a German name because it was part of the German colonial empire from 1884 until 1914 when it fell to Australian forces at the beginning of the First World War. This little frog differs from its closest relatives, the other members of the subgenus Batrachiolodes, on the basis of its minute body size, degree of digital disc expansion, reduced subdigital tuberculation, colour pattern and other traits related to its small size. The authors also provide a description of the new species' simple advertisement call. The diversity of these frogs of the Bismarck Archipelago is most likely still underestimated despite several recent surveys. We believe that there are going to be more species in this genus are found very soon. Madagascar is home to an incredible diversity of lemurs, most of which are endangered, mostly due to habitat encroachment. A new species in the genus Hyralgias has been described from Ramathana and Randringetritra National Parks. Ramathana National Park is a rainforest situated in the montane region and Andakrandritra National Park is comprised of grassland, lowland and highland forests displaying great altitudinal variation. Both parks are known to harbour wide species diversity in flora and fauna. Genetic and morphometric analyses of the samples collected from these localities confirm that this Caragulalis lineage represents a new species in the C. crossleyi group and has now been elevated to species status as Cariolgarius grovesi, named after the British-Australian biological anthropologist, evolutionary biologist and taxonomist Colin Groves. Although new species of herbs from rainforests are not unusual, this pretty little skink was found in an urban Two specimens of an undescribed species of Ligosoma were caught in pitfall traps in an urban rainforest in Kuching and from the base of a forested hill in western Sarawak, east of Malaysia. The new species is diagnosable from all Southeast Asian congeners by morphological character and most closely resembles Ligosoma herbati from the Thai Malay Peninsula. The new species is described on the basis of this distinct morphology and genetic divergence. It is the third species of Ligosoma known from Borneo and highlights the continuing rise in lizard species diversity on the island. In addition, the discovery of this species from a small urban rainforest underscores the importance of preserving intact rainforest areas of any size in maintaining species diversity. This pretty little species of cichlid, Gymniophagus taroba, is a new member of the Gymniophagus setaquus group. The three species in the group are diagnosable from each other and from other species of Gymniophagus by stable differences in several morphological characteristics, amongst which the best are found in coloration patterns. Body and head shapes and meristic characters show lesser differentiation, but several are also clearly just diagnostic. The prime candidates for this fragmentation speciation are the origins of the waterfalls on the individual tributaries of the river. The largest of the waterfalls, the famous Cataractas del Igazu, with a height of 72 metres, separated G. Taroba species from its closest relatives. And finally, the avifauna of Rote Island and the Lesser Sundas is not well studied and generally considered to be similar to that of adjacent Timor Island. 
However, some cases of bird endemism have recently been documented on this island. A population of Mygrosoma honeyeater is one such example. First observed in October 1990, it has been subsumed with Mysomela damanani from Sumba Island, given its superficially similar appearance. Based on extensive morphological inspection and bioacoustic analysis, we here describe this population as a new taxon to science. Apart from previously overlooked plumage distinctions, the new taxon bioacoustically differs from M. damamani in the presence or absence of several unique call types and considerable differences across the two parameters in shared call types. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. Before we go, there's this. And in next month's episode... What on earth have they found at Powell's Peace? And this. Ever since we restarted this show back in the summer, we've been telling you how Louis was going to set up a Patreon campaign. Well, he's done it. And you can come, see what he's done, and hopefully support us in a very real way at this address. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching this month's episode and we hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it and we hope you tune in next time where we have a very special announcement. Goodbye! As Charlotte quite rightly says, yes, we've got some very exciting news for you next month. I wish I could tell you now, but unfortunately it's embargoed. 2018 is shaping up to be a really interesting year for the Centre for Fortune Zoology and we look forward very much to being able to share our adventures with you as they happen. Thank you very much for watching and thank you very much to everybody who has helped. And we'd like to say a big thank you to all of you who support us each month. So, until next month, we'll be seeing you. Mm -hmm.